following hospital admission for, for COVID in England from uh, this routinely collected data set called, called CHESS. And we hope, we're hoping to infer um, disease severity and hospital resource usage statistics and comparing the relative merits of these different modeling frameworks for telling us what we want to know. Um, so like I said, this is a part of an entire program all about modeling the epidemic basically and there's different there's a big jigsaw puzzle puzzle there's different pieces of of modeling there's the transmission modeling which the, which is what really gets in the gets in the news it's that's informed by um, observed deaths and many other sources of data and estimates covid incidents deaths the r numbered comparisons between regions and so on um it's a big, big issue of correcting the number of deaths for reporting delay that we've done some um, more methodological work on, but this particular work is about outcomes, um, about the severity of the disease and resource use. This is outcomes for people who have um, contracted the disease, and this work is, in particular is about outcomes after admission to hospital. Um, so yeah, I refer to you to the <coughs> link below for more information about this whole, whole program. So the data set um, I'm analysing in this particular bit of work is called the COVID-19 Hospitalisation in England Surveillance System. It, it's a, a surveillance system that was originally set up for, for, for flu. Um, it's, it's now been re renamed SARI Watch for Severe Acute Respiratory Infections, but it's, uh, it is, we, we managed to get this up, set this up quickly at Public Health England for monitoring COVID data as, as the as the epidemic in, in uh, England began in uh, February, March time. And it records daily individual level data on every ICU admission um, from all NHS trusts in England. And a subset of those trusts also report individual data on all hospital admissions. And it's the, that subset which I'll be um, focusing on in, in this talk. And we, we, the analysis here is also restricted to those who we think um, got infected outside of hospital. Um, and we're judging, but judging that by um, the positive test was taken um, within two days of, of admission. And that, the, the reason behind doing that is to um, exclude the hospital acquired infections, which we think would have a, di a very different kind of prognosis and pattern. So we'll analyze those separately because people who are already, already in hospital for, for some other, other condition. Um, and we, also managed to, uh, Public Health England managed to link this data set to the death register. So we've got good follow up for, for mortality. Okay, how are we going to model this? This is, this is a multi state model I'm using. The, the starting state is hospital admission, that's the time, the time zero of the process. Um, and we will model transitions. Um, what we call them. So this IC, we're modeling ICU admission and death and discharge from hospital and people can die or be discharged from hospital from either this state, hospital state or this ICU state. But I should, I should note here that people don't get sent home straight from um, intensive care. But the, what we did here was, I mean, there was limited data on the dates when people would, were discharged from ICU. So what we did were, was we just merged this ICU state with what we call a post ICU ward stay. So the, the this state two is kind of a everything that happens after they've after somebody's been admitted to ICU. So the data set gives us all the, all of the, these dates of these events of interest if if the, the, if they were if they happened um, mostly. So we observe all dates of hospital admission. We observe all dates of ICU admission, um, and within a certain length of follow up. Um, up to the date of data extraction, um, we observe all deaths. But there's two kinds of censoring going on here. So at the data of data extraction, if somebody has died, then we will know about it because the data was linked to the ONS death register. But we, what we don't know is whether they were they've been discharged from hospital. Um, some of the sometimes we do. Sometimes we know that somebody some somebody is in the hospital or out of hospital. But there's so there was um. Some a lot of missing data where we thought that the um, these this discharge just they just didn't record it and it did happen. So there's two different kinds of censoring. 
either they're still in hospital at the date of death through extraction or they're alive, but it's unknown whether they're still in hospital. And we're, we're going to handle this by kind of likelihood based statistical methods. Um, so before I talk about the statistical methods, just to summarize the, the data. So this is the entire data set um, tabulated tabulated here in terms of the what, what events happened. So you've got people who went to ICU and people who didn't go to ICU. And for those two groups, the people who count how many, 30% 30, 30 of them died. 59% um, of them were discharged. And then there's this censoring, 10% 10, 10 um, where they, um, it's, it's un unknown whether they were still in hospital at the end of the, the, the follow-up. And 20% of them went to, went to ICU. There was a tiny number of kind of events whether the date didn't happen, but not enough really to influence the results. So we just dropped those. And you cannot, we're also interested in um, this, in the this, this statistics of these outcomes by, by age and gender for this particular analysis. So at the end, I'll talk about a lot more work we've done on this and related data sets where we're looking at other, other covariates, but in this particular analysis, we're just looking at age groups. So we have defined five different age groups, male and female. And some of the outcomes here, you can see the gradient in um, severity with, with age, so the risk of death, um, as it's well known, the risk of death increases with, with, with age. Um, the severe outcomes are more common for, 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 for men than women. And the, the ICU admissions. So, the there are more ICU admissions among the people among people under under seventy five um, compared to, to over seventy five. Um, and that's part that's part of um, part part of the, the the hospital policy. But we want to estimate all of these the probabilities of these events while accounting for censoring. So we don't want to just na naively summarize the proportion of people who who had it. This event, we want to estimate the, those while uh, accounting for this this limited follow up. Um, the as well as the probabilities of the of these alternative events, we also want to estimate the the times to events or the distribution of the times to events over individuals. So this is a, a kind of there's a histograms of the times to events over individuals um, for each event. This is this is so this is the next event after hospital. So did they did die? without getting to ICU, or were they admitted to ICU, or were they discharged before getting to ICU? So the this ICU admission happens in nearly all cases, the less than five days after hospital admission. Um, and death or discharge is usually less than 20 days after admission. But the big thing to notice here is this, this long tail. Um, there's some observed events that Last, last a long time. So people stay in hospital a long time before either dying or being discharged. And then there's this long tail of people who are either we don't know what's happened to them or, or we know that they're, we're sure that they're still in hospital after, after two, three months, after two, three, two or three months after be, of being admitted. And you'll see, you'll, you see the consequences of that for the statistical modeling um, later on. So it's, essentially it's large, big times of, of right censoring and a, a big kind of unknown tail. Some moderate difference between the the age groups here, but not in in terms of times to events. But that, it's not massive compared to the the probabilities of the uh, of the events. Okay, we will compare two different methodological frameworks now for building a this multi state model. So we've got this four state model that we want to estimate. Um, I will compare a framework based on call specific hazards, which is I think it's the more well known way of constructing a um, competing risks are a multi-state model um, in terms of hazards of different transitions. And I'll con contrast that with, with a, a less well-known framework based on mixture modeling. And um, this has some, some advantages, some disadvantages that I'll talk about. Um, but both of these methods we, we will implement in a, a fully parametric way. Um, and this, this is an interesting point for discussion really about the uh, relative merits of parametric and non-parametric methods. And we, we did consider both of these ways of doing things, but there's, there's <clears throat> one reason was that the parametric um, methods gave us more stable estimates at those later times when, when the data was sparse and it allowed some 
short-term extrapolation. And this is because we, we, we wanted to use these methods quite early on in the, the epidemic when the, the, the follow-up was limited. And we wanted, you know, the people need quick, reliable estimates of, of, of quantities so of interest and to make decisions um, based on expected long-term outcomes. And it's all very odd to say you don't know. We're not, we don't know what these long-term outcomes are going to be. Um, but with the, with the parametric methods, we could maybe compare alternative assumptions and still get you know, some kind of, of extrapolation um, that we could use some kind of judgments um, to uh, decide what, which is which is more more, more plausible. Another other quite convincing justification, which you know, our team modeling team liked, is that we 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 want to use the results here as inputs for fully Bayesian evidence synthesis models for transmission and hospitalization and long-term outcomes. And if you've got a fully everything fully specified as a, a parametric distribution, then that's that's easier to, 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 to slot into these fully Bayesian evidence synthesis. Um, but I, it is, it is an, really an open question. And it's just the, it's the, this is what we went for as a, as a parametric way of doing things. So I'll, um, right, I'll spend a few minutes now talking about this first um, methodological framework is using cause specific hazards. And uh, it's got a long literature, a um, couple of big citations at the top. Uh, there's how it works is that an individual who is in state R is subject to a hazard of transition to different alternative states S. So the, that's the thing that could happen to them next. It's a generalization of a, a hazard. In a, in a survival model, the hazard of death, but a generalization to the more than one, one state. And we can, we define the time scale so that T represents the time since you became at risk of that transition. So it's the time since entry to that state. And that, that gives you a, a semi, what's called a semi Markov model. And the, you, the one way of interpreting these hazards is as defining these latent times of transitions to competing states. Um, and this is a, a slightly controversial way of thinking because it's like a, a counterfact counterfactual quantity where um, only one of these times will happen to the person. A, a person can only ever go to one of these competing states. Um, so we can kind of con can conceptualize um, the minimum of these latent times as being the transition that actually happens. And if we can you know, imagine these, these um, weird quantities, then we can interpret this, these lambdas, these cost specific hazards as hazard functions defining the latent time to that event. And um, it's, I mean, it's, you, you don't need to invoke this idea of a latent time to be able to construct the likelihood of this. I think there's a proof a paper by Prentice, I think in 1978, but it, I think it, these things make it easier, I think, to, um, to think about how the models are implemented in, in software. Um, and, but it's yeah, the, only one of them can actually happen, and the, the, these things that latent times don't really exist. Um, so to complete this model, you have to define a parametric distribution for the, the the hazard function, and there's a wide range of choices in software. I'll talk about that a bit later. And so in this specific application, we've got five different um, hazard functions to to estimate corresponding to these five different transitions. So these are the three competing events following hospital admission. And um, that's hospital to ICU, hospital to death or discharge without getting into ICU. And for people who's, who've just got to ICU, um, there's competing risks of, de of death and, and discharge. So to, to implement these models, the trick that you use is that um, the, if, if, the, if the event does happen, then that's fine. You've got a, a likelihood contribution that's the time to that event, it's the, the parametric survival function for the time to that event. But if an event, event doesn't happen, then it contributes a, a kind of centering term. Um, the competing events that don't happen come into the likelihood as a kind of centering term. But there's, there's plenty of tutorial papers if you want to learn more about this, if you're not familiar with it. But the full likelihood can be defined by the product of five transition-specific likelihoods. And if the parameters of those models are distinct, which, I mean, there's good, fairly good data in this case to estimate five distinct sets of um, parameters, then we, we can use standard software to uh, 
fit each of these five different survival models independently. But that's not all, that's not all that we want to do is to estimate those hazards. Um, well, well, we will also want to um, calculate the probabilities and the times predicted times to events, um, which I will talk about not quite now, but now I'll talk about how to define the parametric distribution. So this is a, a choice that you have to make, a selection between different parametric functions. Um, and we used AIC to choose between them and we, we used flexible models and the particularly useful form we found to be the generalized gamma, which is a three parameter distribution that encompasses um, some more commonly used distributions like the Weibull and the gamma and those fit, fitted best for those transitions from hospital or ICU to discharge. And the other model family that we considered um, is maybe less familiar. It's a, a cure model. So this is a kind of mixture model. And how it works is that you've got a standard parametric model for people who um, will eventually experience the latent events. Um, but you've got a, a subset of those who we know for sure will never have this event. So you've got a, what's called a cure fraction, which is basically a point mass on uh, event time of infinity. So it's quite, it's quite strange. Um, but empirically, we found that this, this style of model fitted best for the transitions to ICU and death. So that rep represents a kind of long tail of people who are, we think are at lower risk and they stay in hospital for a long time, but they, we, we think that they're not going to die and they're not going to go to ICU. Um, but we don't use these models for the transitions to discharge because we, we assume that everybody's going to um, get discharged eventually. So that something is bound to happen to, to, uh, to, uh, to every person um, in, in the model when you predict from it. Um, there's also the covariates. How, so how do these, these come in? Um, there's lots of model parameters, but in the software we're using, which I'll mention later, there's some model parameters depend on age and gender. And we, we chose which model parameters those were, again, by this model selection. So I see model selection procedure. So you can check the fit um, of these cost specific hazards against non parametric estimates um, using this um, construct where you've got some observed data and some censored data for the event that that doesn't happen. And you can see here here in these curves, this um, cure um, formulation because the, the survival curve converges to a value which is positive. So some people would be predicted to, to never die and never go to ICU. There's a heart, this up, up to half of them. Um, so if, if you haven't been to ICU by two or up to five days, then it's the model will assume that that, that latent event will, 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 will never happen. And then, so, so this model fits quite well comparing to these parametric, these non-parametric estimates, but they allow some short-term extrapolation beyond in this tail where there's a lot of noise in those um, non-parametric estimates. So this is the fit by age, age and sex strata. Okay, so we want to predict from these models because the things that the policymakers, the, you know, the government, the SAGE, and that they're really interested in is that the hospitalization fatality rate and the length of stay for survivors and non-survivors. Um, so those don't, they don't pop out instantly from these models because these hazard functions define times to latent events. But what we want is the, to summarize the, the time to the event that actually happens. And that's a bit more um, cumbersome to calculate. Um, so firstly, I mean, the probability that the next event after state R is state S, you can calculate that um, using a differential equation and principle. And this is a kind of competing risks generalization of this principle that a survivor function is a simple transformation of the cum cumulative hazard. Um, and that's not too hard to calculate, but the, 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 the thing that is um, a bit of a faff to calculate is the expected time to the next event for people who experience that event. And we have to rely on simulation for that. So we simulate those latent times and take the minimum of, of the, those latent times to be the event that happens, then just do, do that for a massive population, then, then summarize that summarize that sample. Um, it, it, it takes a while of uh, grinding the computer, especially if you want 
um, confidence intervals on every, everything as well by, by bootstrapping. So, but it was, it, it, we, we, we could do it we, uh, within a few hours for the models that we wanted to do. All right, so I'll take a, a breath here and that describes the cost specific hazard modeling framework for competing risks. So we want to compare that with this alternative framework and explain why we considered that uh, in a minute. But this, this framework is based on, on mixture modeling and, and it's slightly obscure. I had to dig a little bit to find this reference, but the, the, the reference here is Larson and Dinser, um, JRSSC in the 80s, where, where they've described this model in full generality, but it actually goes back to, to, to David Cox's work on kind of competing ex exponential distributions in, in the 50s. Um, and there's a, another group of researchers here who've done a few applications using, using this um, mixture modeling framework. But I mean, I always want to know some more, more, more literature uh, on this so, because it's, uh, it's quite nice. And the reason why it's nice is because the, it, it, gives you, it gives you directly the quantities that the policymakers want to know. So you construct it by um, defining the probabilities for somebody who's been admitted to hospital that the next day after, after hospital will be death or the next state will be ICR, or the next state will be discharge. So it dis describes um, the probability of the next event that happens. And also we parameterize the time to the event conditional on, on that event actually happening. So those are the, exactly the quantities that we want to know. And the difference from the cold specific hazard model this is where this is where I think it, I find it's useful to have this idea of latent times. So we don't invoke latent times in this mixture model. We parameterize the time to the event which actually happens, and that's going to be smaller than the, the those latent times to the events that may or may not happen. Um, so I, mean, I hope that makes sense. It's, it's slightly easier to to work with in in that sense, um, but has some disadvantages which might become a little bit clearer when I talk about how to fit it. So the likelihood um, is constructed like this. So you've got uh, observed data for the events that happen and the likelihood contribution of those is simple. So you've got a probability of that event happening in a, a PDF of the time to event distribution for the events that happen. And for the people who, who are censored, so we don't know which of the competing events happen, what we've got is this, this mixture model and it's we we have to sum over the competing events um, that may happen in the in, in the future for somebody who is censored. Um, and actually, I've, I've forgotten to mention how we modify that, but there is a modif modification of this likelihood to, in this case, to account for the fact that we know so, that some people are alive, are alive, but we don't know whether they have been discharged from hospital or not, but it, it's technically that wasn't too hard. So I won't, I won't really go into those details. But the disadvantage here of this model compared to the cost specific model is that there is it's less efficient to maximize because this mixture model thing is a function of a greater number of parameters. It doesn't factorize nicely into these components that you can maximize it independently. Um, and, but you can, you can, you can use an, an EM algorithm to, to, to fit it, but it's still um, slightly less efficient and more prone, we found, to um, non-convergence and these, these awkward numerical problems. So we did a parametric model selection in the same way as the, for the other style of model, and generalized gamma models also were found to be quite useful. Uh, the covariates selection again as before and I'll what have we got now um, yeah it's a software but I'll I will discuss at the end um, some more um, conclusions for how, what, what, what we thought were the different advantages of, of these different frameworks in kind of more general situations so software yeah so we used our we use a package called FlexServe um, which, which I developed so that you can fit survival models with flexible parametric distributions, and it ex extends to multi-state models to these. And we extended it to deal for this work to deal with this new family of of mixture models that 
didn't have any general purpose software implementation before that I, that I certainly that I'd, I, I'd seen. And you can also define your own parametric distributions if it's not built in. Uh, you can use these models based on splines, which are sometimes quite useful, uh, but they didn't really add anything in this application. And you can also have covariates on any parameter of the distributions, even your shape and your different kind of scale parameters through. And that defines very flexible, for instance, non-proportional hazards models, for kind of flexible dependence on, of things on, on, on time. Um, and that's some CRAN and later the latest features are on GitHub. I should also, I'm not a Stata user, but I also hear very good things about the, the software by My Michael Crowther in Leicester, who's written a whole bunch of Stata packages to deal with a um, very similar range of flexible parametric survival and multi-state uh, models. <clears throat> okay, I, I've gone backwards here, but let's go forward. So let's remind ourselves, this is the model, model that we're fitting. It's a four state model with five different transitions. And we're gonna compare these two different cost specific or modeling framework or mixture modeling frameworks. So yeah, I should say to, to do the mixture model, you actually implement two different mixture models. This is one mixture model for the three competing moving events following hospital admission, and another mixture model for the two competing events following ICU. Uh, you fit those separately, but in the end, um, under either framework, we, we want to couple everything together so we can make forecasts for somebody who's just a bit to hospital. What would we? We can forecast the the entire process by piecing together these different um, different components. Of course, I'll generalize that to even more states in different data sets. I'll talk about that at the end of the discussion. Backwards again. Anyway, so this is so this slide is comparing the goodness of fits of the the best fitting of the mixture models with the best fitting of the competing risks, cost specific hazards models. Um, and it's comparing them against non-parametric estimates. These are all in Johansson estimates of the probability that each of these competing events has happened by a certain time. So the competing events are um, death, discharge, or ICU following hospital admission. Um, we've, you've got the still in hospital curve in, in, in light blue here. So these, the models um, fit uh, fairly well. The, 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 the lack of fit, only lack of fit here is in the, out in the tail where we've got less data and the, the different models give slightly different um, extrapolations beyond the end, end of the data. And this is the models following hospital admission. And these are the models following ICU admission of the, the two competing events of of death and discharge. Um, the, this noisy stuff here on the right hand side is for the, the older people who didn't did get, get admitted to ICU. So, we've got, so there's a, the non-parametric estimates are based on very small samples here. Um, so there's a certain amount of borrowing of information going on in, in the, these age effects um, and we get more stable estimates from the parametric models and the, the there's some disagreement um, between them, but we can get an, an estimate and a confidence interval um, for the for our long-term predictions, even, even in the, the absence of data, as long as we believe the, 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 the parametric assumptions. But overall, um, the we found that the cost-specific hazard model, model fitted the data better, it, it, judging by an overall kind of AIC calculation. So that's some evidence um, in favor in favor of that for that specific data set. About we we'll talk a bit more about the the different assumptions. Um, where are we going now? So here's here are the results. Oh yeah, it, I mean it also matters whether the results are the same. So this is the probability that somebody who has just been admitted to hospital will die before reaching ICU, or the probability that they will be admitted to to ICU. So there's a, there's a, as you know, there's a big age gradient here. Um, there's a very high fatality rate even before um, reaching ICU for these older people, uh, 30 and 40 percent. Um, slightly higher risks for men compared to women, but the difference isn't so sharp as the age difference. And there is a the, the wee bit of disagreement between these two um, parametric models. Um, for the predictions for older people. 
And the chance of going to ICU, the, the, these estimates agreed between these two models. Um, and it shows quite, so quite clearly that the 45 to 65 year olds were most likely to, to be admitted to ICU. And we, we can, as well as the probability of the, these events, remember we want to know the distribution of the times to these events. So this graph deserves a bit of um, explanation. So we comparing between the two models here, there's the dotted line for the mixture model and the solid line for the competing risk model. We're expressing heterogeneity between patients here. So this is the distribution over individuals of the time to event as this um, interval. Um, there's this 10 to 9. 10 to 90 percent quantiles of the median as the blue blob and the mean as the the red blob so if we compare between the two models the medians agree well but the means tend to disagree uh, for this this time to death and also the upper tail of the distribution dis disagrees kind of quite strikingly between these these two these two models <laughs> especially for the um time to death um, where the, the, the eventual event is, is unknown, whether the censored data, whether the, the people who were, um, whose final, final outcome, outcome wasn't known. Um, and the it's, time to ICU is fairly well estimated as uh, about two, two or three days. And times, times to discharge for people who survive um, before getting to ICU, um, there's a bit of disagreement in the mean and the upper tail, but a good agreement in the, in, in, in the mean, and that's uh, around less than 30 days for, for, for most people. And the probability of death following ICU admission, um, well, yeah, we know, we, we know this is a very, very, very serious disease. Uh, it's, it's not um, big news here, but the it's an extremely high fatality rate um, for both men and women, um, and, and there's a very sharp age gradient there, 70% fatality rate for the over 75s in this in this data set um, and we can also combine those with the times to the next either death or discharge following ICU admission and the influence of censoring wasn't so great um, for this so I mean the the estimates were somewhat more um, well informed um, we had good Interval point and interval estimates that there's a bit of disagreement, but not so so much as for those model events following hospital admission, and consistent between those two alternative ways of looking at the the, the parametric modelling. So what what we really wanted to do is combine everything and have an overall multi-state model, and um, so we can combine this component um, with the um, component for events following hospital and get events uh, get these estimates from the full must say model of the, the final outcome, the probability, the, the, the hospitalized, the overall hospitalization fatality rates. So the probabilities of death from um, death, uh, death from COVID from a person who has just been admitted. Um, and you see that, that fam familiar, familiar age gradient again, and slight difference between men and women. And we have the time to that, that, that final outcome of either death or, or discharge from hospital um, that we can use use this these kinds of estimates to inform um, hospital planning um, like length of stay hospital resources resource planning um, and again so the, the the instability here in, in the, these these upper this upper tail where the the eventual mean of the distribution um, was was badly estimated but the median we were quite confident in, in, in the median. Um, and if we were to place our bets on one of these two models, and we would go with the one which is overall, which fits better, but we would present you know, the uncertainty. Um, but we would acknowledge that uncertainty um, that comes from this, the parametric model choice. Okay, so yeah, um, I think that I, I won't go into go further into detail of results for different COVID um, outcomes. Um, we were, yeah, it's, it's, the, the method, we were 
as, as I'll explain, we're, we're doing some more analyses on different data sets and looking at different predictors and different models. I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, talk about the, summarize the kind of discussion points on the, the methods in the light of what we learned from this application. Um, I think we think that you know, this, this mixture model modeling framework is, is, is worth considering in this kind of application where what you want is, a, is the, these probabilities that these events will happen and the times to these events, um, the, these things that the, 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 the policymakers really want to know, um, the models give them directly. Um, they're harder to fit, but they're feasible to fit given the, the software that we, we have. I mean, we're, we, the, we're, we're pushing them quite hard now because um, we're trying to put more, more covariates in them. And I think that's where they start to scale less well because you've got you might you've got lots of different competing events, and each of those events might have parameters that depend on lots of different covariates. Um, so that might get you a likelihood that depends on maybe over a hundred parameters. And so when you've got big data sets, we've got tens of thousands of, of, of cases. I was comparing. Um, you know the relative merits of these diff two different modeling frameworks. I think they both they both have their use, and they're both worth worth considering um, when you're in a similar application. But we're pushing them quite hard computationally by um, giving them more covariates, estimating more stuff from from, from bigger data sets. Um, so I think I should I mean I should, I should emphasize we were, the purpose here was to summarize outcomes for kind of broadly defined population subgroups. Um, by age and gender, this, the things that the, the policymakers want to know uh, to guide kind of resource usage and monitoring severity of the ep epidemic for a, at a population level. But I, you might conceive that in other applications, you'd be more interested in individual level um, risk prediction. And those kinds of models, you might want to stick a big loads and loads of covariates in, um, but, and then the models would face you know, slightly different challenges. Um, I, should, I mean, I should say there's, lo there's, there's more, lots more frameworks for multi-state and competing risks model that I didn't mention. There's this um, regression on the cumulative instance curves, this kind of fine and gray and kind of parametric equivalents of those that I, that I didn't mention that are more focused towards estimating covariate effects, I think, um, that you might, might also want to consider in different, if, depending on what question you're, you're trying to address um, with, with, with the modeling. Um, so, yeah, and <clears throat> like any parametric model, um, it deserves um, a bit of sensitivity analysis for if the, if the assumptions are sensitive to the um, what model you're assuming for extrapolation. And the, I think the big one, big assumption that we were making was that with those cure models, I think, remember I said that we were assuming that everybody is going to get discharged eventually from hospital, but there is a, a latent fraction who will never get admitted to ICR and never die, or you, you, you can infer that they, they can never die after a certain point from the data if, if they lived past a, uh, past a certain point. So that, I think that was the, the key assumption, I think, that was driving um, the difference between the two modeling frameworks. Um, but it's something to state with your results um, and acknowledge that, that sensitivity. Um, as well as checking your goodness of fit to the, the, the data that you observe. All right, so I, I'll just quickly um, summarize um, the, how this fits into kind of our program of work. And we, we this, this was just one specific um, application of to one specific data set that we, that we presented um, last summer. It's based on the first wave data. It's follow-up, it was data collected between March and August in the, the final follow-up. Um, and we looked a bit more at that data set to look at changes through time. Um, and also to compare the different um, regions of England. Um, the, I think the most striking finding from that was that the hospital hospitalization, the, the fatality rates for somebody just admitted to hospital, they fell throughout that first wave, but since then they've gone back up again um, from the, Judging from the further follow-up of this data set to October and, 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 and November, um, I could well, I, I, I haven't been getting hands-on 
with this work, but the findings are, all, are quite nuanced in terms of um, different age groups and different regions and change, changes through time.